name is Shauna Young and I'm the Executive Director of Duke Tip. I am delighted to introduce the Dean of Admissions, Undergraduate Admissions at Duke, Christoph Gutentag. He is a native of California. Christoph mm -hmm. actually graduated from the University of California at Santa Barbara with highest honors, majors in philosophy and music history theory. He received his master's degree in musicology at the University of Pennsylvania. He then went into admissions at UPenn spent several years there, nine years there, um, and then moved from there to a Duke University at, in 2005. And he's been the Dean of Undergraduate Admissions since 2005. Um, many people know of our Dean. He's done a lot of work around being more transparent about the college admissions process for all students. We appreciate the time that he gives to you today. Um, I'm sure you'll have questions. Christoph will also be really, I enjoy the talk because he shares things that I don't always hear other deans of admissions share. So let's welcome him and thank him for his time. All right, thank you. Um, there's stuff up here that I'm going to put in this room. All right. Isn't this great? Don't you love this? Aren't you excited? Aren't you? I mean, parents, you know, you've known this about your kids for a while, right? So this is really just kind of confirmation of the suspicions that you had um, that your child is smarter than you. So. <laughs> I've been there. I've, I've, I've literally, I've literally, well, almost literally been in your seat. My, my daughter was a, my daughter was a, uh, a tipster. She was a talent search kid. She did the grand recognition ceremony. Um, so, so that was, you know, it's, it's special and it's kind of weird when you're having an argument with your child and, you know, they tell you how to make a better argument. Um, uh, so there are a bunch of things. Ooh, thank you so much. Um, so so we we have a, we have an hour together. Um, hopefully, presumably, uh, there will be time uh, before that hour is over for you to ask questions and for me to answer them. I've got I've got all kinds of things I'd like to talk with you about. Um, a couple of things that aren't in my notes, but that I want to make sure to mention. One, I, I see a lot of young men with bow ties, uh, so I think that shows a sign of great, um, great intelligence and taste. Um, the the other thing, though, is okay, guys. Um, so so I, I learned to I, I learned to tie a bow tie just within the last five or six years. All right, and 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 you know, YouTube was just my my savior in that respect. So those of you young men who decided to wear bow ties, um, you know, you need to set a goal of, you know, like a month from now or three months from now or six months from now. If you're not already tying your own ties, you've got to learn to do it. It's not that hard, um, and it will always, um, it will always pay dividends. People, people will always be impressed that you can tie a bow tie by hand. That it's not a clip-on. That it's not, you know, it's not pre-tied. So that's just, so that's one thing. So I just wanted to mention that. Second thing is, all right, so um, maybe, maybe the most important thing, it's not, it's not even in my notes because it just sort of underlies everything that I say, but, but um, and this is, this is geared towards the students and it's kind of geared towards the parents as well, all right? So you're different, you're different, and being different uh, when, especially when you're in middle school and especially in junior high school, they don't even have junior high school, that's how old I am. I went to junior high. And when you're in high school, being different can be hard. Um, and it can be challenging uh, and it can be uncomfortable and, and, and sometimes it affects your relationships with your, with your friends. Um, and, and for some of you, some of you have the social skills um, to navigate that easily. Right, and, and, and that's just something generally that we're born with, just like you were born with the wiring that allowed you to demonstrate the sort of ability that, that allows you to be here, right? We have these, you know, we, we are given these gifts, we are given these opportunities, we are given, we are given these abilities, um, and some of, us, some of us, 
you know, it's, it's not that common to have both really strong social skills and really strong intellectual skills at the same time, right? And I know that you have the really strong intellectual skills because here you are. So if, like me, you were born with strong intellectual skills, but maybe not the strongest social skills, um, uh, you know, it's like, it is what it is. The payoff down the road is great and be strong, right? And be strong and be willing to be different and, and, and be yourself. Um, and that, can be, that can be very difficult. It can be very difficult, um, but it's so worth it because, because many of you, many of you will always be a little different. You're always gonna think a little faster. You're always gonna be having ideas that other people don't. Like, like I still remember, I, I mean, this was 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, 40 years ago. And, 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 you know, I blurted out an idea. I won't even bother to tell you what it was. Um, but it was a good idea and an interesting idea. And the, person, and the person that I was with, we were driving to a conference, said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, right? So he was wrong, by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I didn't like him in the first place, and then I really didn't like him. Um, and not because not because not because people disagree with us, but but because but because they just don't think about things the way you do, the way we do, right? And and that's just going to be that may very well be part of your life for a long time. And part of the really one of the really cool things um, about when you end up applying to college, which you will. Right? And when you end up going to college, which you will, and when you find a college that manages to have the two qualities that I think are critical, which is that it's both comfortable and challenging for you, right? that's you know, comfortable and challenging, when you find that place, you're going to be in heaven. You're going to be finally, I'm with people that get the way I am. I'm finally with people that understand my jokes um, or at least appreciate them, um, you know. And, and so, so, so find, uh, you will find those opportunities. And between now and then, do your best to find those opportunities. I know that when my daughter did the TIP summer program, like that was, that was three weeks of finally, you know, <laughs> finally. But there are all kinds of programs like that. And, and, and uh, you know, the other, the other 49 weeks, it can be a little difficult. Um, but, but uh, you know, so, so, Acknowledge the fact that you're, that you're a little different. Accept it, live with it, enjoy it, and realize that, and realize that um, the payoff in all kinds of ways for, for having the skills that you have, having the abilities you have, having the wiring you have, having the opportunities you have, thinking the way you do, they're real payoffs. But, you know, teenagerhood isn't necessarily the time when those payoffs are really clear. So, uh, so the corollary to that, parents, um, and and honestly, I've only got one child, and I and I've been giving this. I, I think I've been I think I've been addressing this group since before my daughter was born. All right. So I had the challenge of actually following my own advice, um, <laughs> uh, which well, you know, which I did okay. I did okay. But one of the things I kept on telling people and one of the things I kept on telling myself, and so this is addressed to parents precisely and, and specifically, meet your children where they are. Meet your children where they are, right? When my daughter was born, I mean, no, it's kind of sick, but you know, I'm a dean of admission, so when my daughter was born, I was thinking, ooh, where's she going to go to college, right? So, <laughs> but don't lie. Some of you were thinking the same thing. I know you were. Um, so, so what's hard sometimes for us as parents, when we have bright children, when we have high aspirations, um, you, you know, it, it, and, and, and we come from all of the different backgrounds that we come from, sometimes it's hard to meet our kids where they are instead of where we wish they were or where we feel like they should be. The degree to which we're able to meet our children where they are, to accept them where they are, to support them where they are, to encourage them where they are, right, that's so valuable. And, and, and when I did that as a parent is when things worked out well. And when I had my own ideas and when I was trying to push her in a direction that she really didn't want to go or wasn't able to go or wasn't ready to go, right, that's, when things got, that's when things got more difficult. All right. Uh, all that said, parents, um, can I just say, like, the next two years, two, three, four years, may be a little rough, so. 
I used to think it was just girls, but no. Guys, too, you know, it's like, anyway, so good luck to you all. Um, <laughs> it ends, yeah, it gets better. Um, okay, so, um, so I wanna, so, so, so I, I swear I'm not gonna talk for the whole hour, even though none of what I said was actually in my notes, all right, so this will, I will not, I will not talk that long. Um, but I love doing this. I love talking with people. I think, I, you know, it's so exciting to be here. It's so exciting to be recognized for abilities, um, <clears throat> for, for talent, if you will. For, and, and, you know, for things that, 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 you know, to some degree we don't really have control over. Our children were born the way they are. Um, this is a real accomplishment, right? I mean, to, to have standardized test scores, you know, which typically are in the top 10% for seniors applying to college, right? I mean, when you, when you think about that, right, as the kids would say, that's pretty dope. Um, I'm not allowed to say it, <coughs> uh, but I can quote it. Um, so, and it is, and it's great, right? And it's exciting, and, and it has real meaning. It doesn't always have the meaning that people think that it has, but it has real meaning. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of what, what it means and sort of imagining the next steps, you know, the next five years and, and sort of what, what you all might do in the next four to five, three, four, five years to prepare to interact with people who are in my situation and to prepare for choosing, for choosing a college. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a little advice. Um, or maybe a lot of advice, um, and, and, and give you some guidance. All right. So I'll start here. Um, so testing counts. All right. In the college, I mean, I'm not big, big surprise here. In the college admissions process, good testing, the sort that you've already demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate for the next five years, that counts. It matters. It doesn't matter as much as people think it always does, but it matters. It's a sign. It's an indicator. Um, it's evidence. It's evidence of ability. It's evidence of wiring. It's evidence of opportunity. It's evidence of all kinds of things. Um, but it but it matters, and it will it will it will matter for the foreseeable future. It will matter to people who are in my shoes, who are looking at applicants to college. All right, so. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is there will be, there may be people, there may be people who say, look, you know, with testing like that, you know, you can go to any college that you want to. All right, that's not true, by the way. So, uh, I mean, I wish it were, uh, but, then, but then I'd have to have a class, you know, my, my first year class is 1,700 students. And if, and, if, and if it were true that good testing, you know, would, would let people go wherever they wanted to, my, my freshman class wouldn't be 1,700, it probably would be 17,000, right? Or, or 170,000, because apparently everybody wants to go to Duke, which I'm grateful for. Um, so, so, but academically, testing starts. Then, right, more important than testing, or, or connected with testing, are courses and grades. Courses and grades, and specifically, with respect to course selection, right? And I'm really glad to be talking with you now because parents, some of you are going, some of you will have your children in schools that will know how to respond to abilities like this. They know, they know the kinds of courses to, to put, uh, put stu bright gifted students in. They have tracks that, that you know they've they've seen students like yours before and they and they sort of know what to sort of sort of how to support them and and how to respond to them. Others of you, others of you are going to be in schools or in school districts that don't really know what to do with kids like yours. You know they kind of go oh, we we kind of don't know. You know wow well we can't put a seventh grader you know into a class with tenth graders even though that's kind of where she belongs right so. So that's tough, and it will remain tough. And so, parents, your job is to be advocates for your children. Right? You've got you. The, one of the best pieces of advice my wife and I got is that it's our job to be advocates for our child, because nobody else is gonna nobody else is gonna have your child's interests in heart at heart the way you do. Right. So, so in particular, in the next couple of years, pay careful attention to course selection, and and. Because, because it happens that courses that you choose in the eighth grade, it's weird and it's unfortunate, but it happens. Courses that you choose in the eighth grade end up resonating throughout high school. 
right? So, so, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Um, from an admissions perspective, from an admissions perspective, we look for people that are willing to be challenged academically. And the primary, the first way that students, that that is reflected is by students willing to be challenged in their course selection. All right. So that does not mean, by the way, that you have to take the toughest courses in every area. It does not mean that. And sometimes people think it does mean that, and then, and then students get overwhelmed because they're taking, you know, they're taking AP courses or IB higher level courses in areas that really don't interest them, that they're really not that good at, um, and, and then that creates its own set of problems. But in the areas where your child is ready, in the area where your child is, is sort of anxious to, 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 to dig their teeth into the material, right, we pay attention to how a student responds to opportunities how a student responds to opportunities, and that one of the ways that's manifested is in course selection. So when we look at an application, we look at, you know, there, there are academic parts and there are less academic parts, but the academic parts are there are more measurable parts and less measurable parts, or more quantifiable parts and less quantifiable parts. The more quantifiable parts of an admissions application to a university is in the course selection, the grades in those academic courses, and in standardized test scores. Right. So, so that matters, it will always matter, and you help your children by being their advocate. Um, so, when we're looking at applicants, that's the beginning, that's the baseline, right? Um, but that's, and, and this is maybe, this is one of the most important things I can share with you. That's not generally not the basis on which admissions decisions at places like Duke and all of the other schools that you've heard of um, are made. When you're thinking about when you're thinking about selective colleges, when you're thinking about colleges, the name. <laughs> when my daughter was applying to college, um, we identified a group of schools that that I, that I decided to call eyebrow raising colleges. Right? Oh, you go to hmm? Oh, you know, it's like oh. Um, <laughs> Eyebrow raising college. So if so, when you're thinking about eyebrow raising college, you know you go, <laughs> you know you go to the you know you go to the post office. You're sending your kid a care package. You know you talk to the post you know you talk to the post person. And you say you know I'm sending this to my kid at college. Oh, where does she go to college? Blah blah. Oh, you know it's like no, it's, it's, it's fun. You know it makes us feel like we had something to do with it. You know as parents. Which, which if we're really smart, we kind of advocate for them, get out of their way, and keep from them running off the rails. Um, so, so, um, so here's the thing. So we're going to look at academic records, and we're going to go, oh, okay, this, this student has the tools, has the wiring, has the ability, has what it takes. And then we ask ourselves, the next question isn't, you know, what are their grades, what are their courses, because we've got those in front of us, and we know that they're good. Right. So then the next thing we ask ourselves is, is not just, you know, sort of is, is not just sort of what are their grades, but what kind of student are they? Right? That's a different thing. The grades you get and the kind of student you are are not the same thing. And what we're interested in is good students. Now, good students, you know, most good students get good grades. Right? But not everybody, I love, you know, syllogisms, right? Not everybody who has good grades is a good student. And by a good student, essentially we mean good thinkers. We mean two things, good thinkers and people that love to learn. Right? And not everybody who gets an A loves to learn. And not everybody who gets an A is a good thinker. Right? So parents, our job is, our job is not to focus on the grades and a lot of times our students have plenty of focus on that. Our children have plenty of focus on that. Our job is not to focus on the grades. Our job is to focus on the learning and the thinking and the engagement. Right? Our job is to help them be enthusiastic, is to support them in being enthusiastic about what they're learning. To help find, you know, when I say, when I say meet your children where they are, part of what I mean is think about what do they love? What do they easily find themselves to be engaged in? You know, where, where is it easy for them to do more and more, right? What do they love talking about? You know, it's like when your kid talks about stuff, 
Like they're all excited about something. My daughter the other day said, I love integrals. I was like, okay, whatever, yeah. It's like, I mean, I knew, I used to know when I was in high school what an integral was and what it meant and all that. And I could kind of, you know, I can kind of fake it. But, but, but you know, she loves that stuff. So part of our job as parents is to be enthusiastic about what our children are enthusiastic about, even if we don't have the slightest idea of what they're talking about. It's like, you go, you know, awesome, I'm glad. Um, but, but really, I can't emphasize enough that when, we're, that, when, that when people that are in my shoes are making admissions decisions and the committees, when, you know, when, we're, when we're sitting in admissions committee and we're talking about people, we don't talk about grades. We don't talk about AP scores. We don't talk about testing, right? Because that's already all good. It's like, what are they like in class? How do they think? What do they do with opportunities? How engaged are they? What, how much do they love the process of learning? Because when you come to our places, right, the faculty want people that love to learn. They love people that, that enjoy talking about this stuff. They love people that love to think. They love people that like to make connections, that are willing to ask questions, that are willing to be critical, that don't just accept the received wisdom, you know, that, that sort of go, hmm, you know, why is this this way? Or, to, you know, does this relate to this? You know, you said this, he, you know, you said this three days ago and you're saying this today. You know, that seems contradictory to me, you know. And, 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 you know, really, faculty love that. Many teachers love it, not all, um, as you know. Uh, and, you know, a little respect goes a long way, you know, when you come up to a kid, when you come up to a teacher's shoulder, you know, a little respect goes a long way. But, but, um, but really, I, I, I can't emphasize enough that skill, that sense of engagement, that sense of loving learning, that sense of, of thinking about things, of a critical mindset, um, that matters, and it matters a lot. So, so, you know, how you develop that, you develop that in a bunch of ways, but one of them is reading, right? One of them is reading. Read, 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 read. Read. Read whatever you can get your hands on, whatever you like. You know, just not junk. I mean, listen, a little... Okay, look. Um, you know... We don't all eat kale and brown rice all the time, right? You know, it's like, well, you know, I, I mean, you know, if I took a show of hands of how many of us ate, you know, have eaten Doritos or Cheetos in, you know, in the last six months among the adults, right? It would probably be an embarrassing number. Um, so you don't, you don't have to read deep all the time. You know, a little, a, little, a little junk food, a little intellectual junk food, a little guilty pleasure is okay, right? Um, and, but, but, you know, reading is great. Read, there's so much good writing out there, and the pleasures of just sitting with a book in your hand and and diving into that world is it's just it's just immeasurable. So read. The second thing is, and this this gets back to this gets back to being different. Okay, you're going to have ideas that your friends don't have, and you're going to make mistakes. By the way, all right. So let's just live with that. You're going to make mistakes. You're going, you're, you're going to have ideas that you think are great that actually aren't great, uh, and, and some of them that are great. But, but you know, we all make mistakes. We are all wrong. And, and being different means being right sometimes when other people aren't and being wrong sometimes when other people aren't. And, you know, that's just, that's just part of what it, that's just part of the deal. So don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't, you know, it's like, it's so recoverable. You know, take some chances. Try some things out. Don't, don't feel like you've got to follow a particular, a, a particular path. So, so, you know, good thinking is what we're interested in developing. And, and again, when we look at you, when we look at your applications, when we think about you, when we talk about you, it's, it's not the quantifiable stuff that we're interested in. That just tells us what you're capable of. Right? What we want to know is what have you done with that? What have you done with that? And have you developed the critical thinking schools that every, that, you know, the critical thinking skills um, that, 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 that we all like? And, and taking chances is part of that. Taking risks, taking intellectual risks is part of it and going okay that you know that worked or that didn't work that's fine it's really really fine um, 
You don't have to. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get it all right. Um, people will notice this about you. People will notice when you love to learn. People will notice when you think about things. People will notice when you ask questions. People will notice when you ask questions that other people don't. People will notice when you think about things outside of class and come back and ask about, uh, ask about them. People will notice that. And when you apply to college, they will tell us about it. They'll notice it, and they'll tell us about it. So this is, and we like it, you know, just to sort of clue, close that particular loop. Um, you know, um, find things that you love, students. Find things that you love and that matter to somebody somewhere, right? Um, we pay attention to what you do with your time. We pay attention to what you do with, with, the, with, the, with the time that you've got. And if you find things that you love, and you find things that matter, and you find things that are worth doing, and you love them, go for it. And parents, this is, this is sometimes a hard part. I will tell you a quick story. Um, and then I'll move on to the final part of what I want to talk about. And then I'll look at my watch and say, Good. I'm actually on schedule, bizarrely. Um, so my daughter's a STEM kid. Loves math and science, obviously. Um, and um, knew she was going to study math, science of some sort in college. And it's the summer after her junior year in high school. So it's like the critical summer of life, right, when it comes to applying to college. It's like, oh my gosh, what are you gonna do? It's the summer uh, before your senior year, the last chance to show you know, what you're all about. And, um, and she never liked math competitions. It's like, you know, I keep on pushing her. Yeah, don't you want to do it? No, I don't like it. Okay, so really about the 10th time I finally got the message. Um, and we were, some, some lessons are easier to learn than others. Um, and we were looking, so understand, right, this is a STEM, this is, this is a female in STEM, right? Um, so we were looking at summer math programs, science programs, research opportunities, that sort of thing, right? Because, you know, and, and there are all kinds of them, as you, as you will find out. Um, and she didn't really, I mean, she would, be, she would have been fine doing any of those, but she didn't really want to do any of them. You know what she wanted to do? She wanted to spend, um, well, what she wanted to do was spend a month in Berlin by herself. All right. Can we just acknowledge here that intelligence and maturity do not always go hand in hand? <laughs> what she really, that's what she really wanted to do. Um, but what we found was we found a summer immersion program in Berlin, an academic program that was a homestay program, you know, ha half the time studying, sort of half the time cultural activities. Um, and and that, that was half of the summer. And the other half of the summer, she worked at, at, at an arts camp. It was actually a fused glass studio that had like little summer camp um, and that she'd been she'd been going there for a while and so she you know she she got good enough to be able to help out some. Um, and that's what she did the second half. So the first half, month in Berlin at a homestay with an academic program, second half, glass studio. Right? Neither of which and, and and you know so I had to I had to as a parent follow my own advice, which was you know meet her where she was do the thing, you know, allow her to do the things that really matter to her. They were absolutely worth doing, they were, but they were not what the sort of the norm is. And the conversation I had with her and the conversation we had with each other and with my wife was really, okay, look, we think this is fine. Colleges are gonna like this or they're not, but this is who you are, this is what you wanna do, and, and the college that accepts you having done that instead of some of the more typical maybe STEM summer programs, is the college that's going to, you know, you know that they will have accepted you for who you are, not for some image that you created, right? And, and, and if a college doesn't accept you, 
then that's their loss, right? And then that's that's like, you know, then they then 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 that's not the right match for you. And she did not get into every college that she applied to. So so, um, but that worked out great. You know, I mean, it, 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 that that's what she did. She was way happier. She was much happier. She also had more interesting things to talk about in her admissions interview, right? It turns out that she ended up working in a research lab where this, where this ability to work with glass actually came into play a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. So you never know how these things play out. But, but parents, when I say meet our children where they are, what I mean is, you know, this is, this, is the, this is the kind of thing, you know? I mean, let's allow them to be excited because when they apply to college, when they're interviewed, you know, when they're, when they're writing an essay, that excitement, that enthusiasm, that depth, that knowledge, that all plays out. And it, I think it all works to the benefit. I think it all works to the benefit of, of, of the students. Um, so so I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention that. So now, um, Here's the final thing I'm going to share with you, and then and then and then we'll be able to we'll we'll open the floor to questions. Um, and it's about how college admissions works in general. Um, probably the most important thing for you to understand about about the selective college admissions process is that is that it's it, we're creating a class and we're creating a community. We're not sort of just rewarding good behavior. Good behavior being being defined as you know good academics. Right? So, I, my responsibility and the responsibility of all of my colleagues here and all over the country. Um, our responsibility is not to get the class with the best credentials. Right? That's not what I've been asked to do. My job is not to get the highest SAT scores or the best GPAs or the highest class ranks. I mean, yes, they care about that, but I've never ever been told like that's your only goal, that even that's your primary goal, right? What we're doing is we're creating a class and we're creating a community of smart, talented, interesting people who bring different abilities, different perspectives, different interests, different backgrounds, different values all together because college is college is so special college is like the best place you're going to you you know college is the best place to just to just sort of sort of absorb all of the absorb all of the interesting things that there are in the world and have time to reflect on them and to have time to navigate them and to have time to make mistakes and to have time to create these relationships and to learn things from people that are like you and to learn things from people that are not like you. It's so exciting. It, I mean, you can't believe, I mean, it's also super stressful, by the way, so, you know, don't fool yourself. It's not, you know, it's not heaven. Um, uh, you know, it's, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. But I'm creating a class, just like a coach on an athletic team is creating a team, right? No, no, matter, no, matter, no matter what team you're creating, no coach creates a team that is all the same type of player, right? Nobody... You know, nobody, you know, an orchestra is not all the same kind of instruments. And I've spoken, I actually was, I actually was, I actually had the great opportunity. Um, I was at a, I was at a Duke football game and I, and uh, it was a, it was a, a former Duke player, a guy by the name of Jeremy Cash, one of my favorite players of, of, of all time, linebackers playing in the NFL. It was a bye week for his team. I think he was on the Panthers. And so he came, he was actually in, I, I, I ran into him, um, during during the Duke football game, um, and I asked him about you know because because I'd heard about how important the locker room is and the atmosphere in the locker room and how players contribute to the atmosphere in a locker room and I asked him whether that was actually true, and he said he said yeah absolutely, right? Different people bring different skills to the table, and and to have some players who create a good atmosphere in the locker room. Really, you know, and, and avoiding players that create a toxic atmosphere in the locker room really makes a difference for a team. It's the, it's, you know, that's, it's a nice analogy for what we're trying to do. 
yes, you know, we're, we're looking for kind people and good people, but we're looking for different people with different skills and different backgrounds and different values. So I'm, so the most important thing in a way to know about what we do is that I'm creating a class. I'm creating a community. I'm not just picking the people with the strongest credentials. That gets really, you know, that gets tough when you're one of the people with the strong credentials and you're not picked, right? I mean, that, that hurts. It, it actually hurts your parents way more than it hurts you. I, I can tell you. I, I mean, I still, I mean, like, it's been a year and I'm still kind of smarting about the places that didn't admit my daughter, okay? It's like, really? Uh, really? You know, and like, I know the people that did not admit my daughter. <laughs> it's not like they're strangers. It's not like it's some person out there. It's like, oh no, I know exactly who they are. <laughs> My child, right? <laughs> but it, you know, you're gonna feel the same way, um, and you, and it's like my daughter. She's so old, like she doesn't care. You know, she doesn't care, right? And the and kid, kids are way, way, way more resilient than we as adults are. Um, but but so so that's why, honestly, that's why doing what matters, doing what you love, sinking your teeth into things, enjoying what you're learning, that, you know, it matters, first of all, because, because it's more fun and it's more interesting and it's more rewarding. But it also matters because on a very practical level, when we're doing college admissions, that comes out, that comes out in the letters of recommendation, that comes out in the application essay, that comes out in the interview, and, and that's what we look for when we're making admissions decisions. It's sort of not just to put together a talented class, but to put together an interesting class. So you can have two people from exactly the same background living right next door to each other. You know, heck, you could be living in a duplex, right? You know, one of those you know, mirror images of each other, right? With, this, with, the same, with the same courses and the same grades, same standardized test scores. They could even be involved in the same activities. But if somebody's doing, doing them because it matters to them and they love it, and, and, somebody else is doing, and somebody else is doing the same thing because they feel like they need to or they should, that's a distinction that we're comfortable making. Um, Also, um, so I, I sometimes get angry emails from parents. Uh, <laughs> it's part of the job, you know. I, you know, if I have the opportunity to talk about this sort of thing with you, you know, and 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 to share a little bit of of what I believe, you know, the 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 price of the price of angry emails is worth it, you know. And, and I get to be the dean of admissions at Duke, you know, so that's pretty cool. Um, but but so so here's the other thing. This is this is uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll and I'll and I'll finish with this. Um, occasionally, I get angry emails that that say, you know, my child did this and 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 this, right? And and you didn't admit them, right? Why did they bother to do all those things? Right? Which, I, which is really, I mean, you know, which is an understandable question, right? And, and the answer is, you know, because, because we have to pick and choose and because there are lots and lots and lots of talented students that we aren't able to admit and there are some, then some talented students that we are able to admit, right? But one of the things, at least the thing, one of the things that my daughter did not have to ask herself is why did she do the, you know, for, when she thought about the colleges, she, she actually didn't think about the colleges. She, had, she didn't, she wasn't admitted to. I'm the only one that ever thinks about the colleges she wasn't admitted to. But, but we never have to ask ourselves, why did she do those things, right? Because she did them because they mattered and because she enjoyed them and, and you know, and it was time well spent. And so that's, you know, so, so avoiding You know, you, you avoid some regret when, when, when you do the things that matter to you 
and and that are worth doing, even if things don't work out. You know, and we're adults, and we know that not not everything works out all the time. But even when things don't work out, doing things that matter to you, doing things that you care about, doing things where you really feel like that was worth the effort. Um, you know, it's kind of like I don't know. I just <laughs> um, I'm not a I'm not a runner. Um, and, and, but, but, you know, people run races that they know they're not going to win. Right? I mean, that, that probably includes most of us, right? People run races that they know they're not, they enter competitions that they know they're not going to win. You know, and, 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 and why do it if you, know, if you know going in that you're not going to win? Well, you know, because it's an interesting experience because you get to see how much, you, how much you've grown, what you're capable of doing, you learn something about yourself. I mean, right, there are all of these reasons to do things that don't have to do with, with some objective standard out there. So, um, so doing what you love, doing what matters, that, that matters. Um, when you apply to college, and especially when you apply to any selective college, really. You should have faith that people are actually interested in getting to know who you are. The outcome isn't always, the outcome isn't always personal or great, but the process is a personal process. And, and people on my end of the equation really try to understand who these students are. Uh, we, feel, we actually feel a response. My greatest responsibility is to my institution. But my next responsibility is, is to be as fair as I can to the students that are making the effort to apply, who spent all of that time, that, you know, this process that you're just at the beginning of, um, that culminates in applying to college and then enrolling in college and then graduating from college and then moving out and not being dependent on us. Um, that's, I'm still waiting on that. Uh, I'll let you know when that happens. But but we really we really the the the, the process feels impersonal and and it, and it's understandable. But it's a personal process. And so 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 again, we understand students better who are doing things that matter to them. We understand and and that that only helps in the process. So it's it's good from an it's good from a practical perspective, but mostly, you know, the important thing is students are happier, they're more satisfied, they're more fulfilled, and it's a and it's a great habit to get into, and it's one that we as adults could learn as well. So with that, uh, I will stop. I will say thank you very much, um, and uh, we will open the floor to questions. Thank. Thank you, Christoph. I, I should also share that we have 700 students being um, recognized today. So let's give them a round of applause. Absolutely. Congratulations. Just so he knows, and I think it's about 29 states represented, and many families are here today in this session. So we have about 15 minutes for questions um, before your lunch break, and Christoph um, has has volunteer to stay a little bit after that time for those of you that have more questions. But we will break at 1130 and let those of you who want to eat <laughs> do that. And then he'll hang back a little bit to answer more questions. OK? All right, great. Hello. So my name is Ryan, and I'm from Atlanta. So one of my questions is like, how much does volunteering and community service matter to colleges? Yep. That's, a great, that's a great question. And 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 you know how much how much does how much does volunteering matter? Um, and students, so some families, and some communities, and some schools, really emphasize the importance of giving back to a community. And I, I think that's a great value. Um, but it is, it is not something that we consider more important than any of the many other things that students can do. Um, it's not, it, there's, there's no one thing that a student can do that raises them, there's no one activity that raises students above other people. Everybody's got their own 
everybody's got their own things that matter to them. And, and if, if giving back to a community, if making that commitment, if, if that's where you choose to have an impact, I think that's fabulous. And a lot of students do, because that's part of our culture. That's part of our culture right now. But that doesn't mean it's part of every family's culture or every community's culture. And I don't want anybody to feel like, oh, I've got to do X amount of you know, volunteer work in order to be a competitive candidate. Hi. Hi. I'm Nicole from Florida. And um, I had a question about when you're t choosing your high school courses, should that be like dependent on what major you're planning on taking in college? Oh, that's a great question. All right, so so picking courses, picking courses in high school, you know, should that should it depend? Should that reflect um, the major that you think you're going to choose in college? All right. If if that had been the case for me at least with a major in music and philosophy, um, I would have been in big trouble. Uh, so so here's what I think. It's an amazing thing, the degree to which students change their mind when they go to college. Some do, some don't. But um, high school curricula tend to be very limiting. They tend to, they tend to typically fall into you know, the five big categories of you know, English and math and science and social studies and foreign language. right? And sometimes there's some other things in there. Um, but, but they really kind of fall pretty narrowly into those uh, in, into those areas. I would say, I would say that in the courses that you enjoy, in the courses that you're particularly capable in, in the courses that, 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 um, you know, that speak to you within the con, you know, you can push yourself self in those courses. Um, you won't, you generally don't have a lot of choice when you're in high school. I mean, you have some, but, but really, it's kind of between A and A prime, right? It's not between A and, and M. Um, so I would say, I would say, pay more attention to what you're interested in now, and a little. Don't feel like you've got to reflect what what you think your major is going to be. First of all, because that may change, um, and and secondly, because it's not going to make that much difference. It's not going to make that much difference when 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 we're looking at applications. You're, you're gonna get, you're gonna get um, as long as you challenge yourself in the areas where you're capable of it, you're gonna get, you're gonna get more than adequate preparation for any major that you go into. Hey there, I'm uh, Keith, Derek's father. Um, one question I've got is, have you seen any eyebrow raising courses on your admissions applications? Oh, have I seen any eyebrow raising courses? Um, well, I always love it when kids from Texas have football on their transcript. Uh, that doesn't help them any, but it is. An, it's like, really? You're getting a grade for football? It's like, all right. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you go. Um, uh, you know, I'll tell you. Um, I have. I have. Um, because there are because there are some there are some magnet schools there are some you know, residential schools um, you know there, where where the course offerings are really advanced for what's typical for high school and we notice that we notice that um, and at the same time and, and this is really an article of faith for us I, I mean this is really a bedrock principle. We do not expect students to take courses that are not offered in their high school. Uh, like, like, you know, you are to, you know, students that go to public schools are, you know, are to some degree, you know, they're captives to their parents' home address. Uh, and, and that, you know, it's like, and, you know, it's like, I'll do a lot for my kid, but I'm not moving, right? So, so, so we always look at courses that a student has taken within the context of what's available at that school for the top students. So that's so. So the answer is yes, I have, um, but it's not something that I would expect in the overwhelming majority of of applicants that we admit. Um, hi, I'm Sanas from Florida. Do colleges appreciate more if 
a student has a B in an AP course or an A in a standard course? Yeah. Um, which we which we want which we appreciate more a B in an AP course or an A in a standard course, right? Um, so every you know we all know the answer, right? The A in the AP course, right? That's. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you, the only reason you're laughing is because your parents have like seventh graders, you know, and, and you haven't heard that one before, but you'll hear it like a dozen times before, before the next three years are over, four years. Um, so here's the thing. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, I, so so please, please understand, this is within the context of, a, of an admit rate of 8.2%. Right, so um, I don't mind the occasional B. That sounds a little glib. I don't mind the occasional B. Um, um, we, but as a rule, we don't expect perfection. We don't expect perfection. Um, and, and most of the time, perfection isn't worth it, by the way, um, uh, or apparent perfection. However, we do expect, we, so, but, but the rule of thumb is challenge yourself without getting in over your head. So, so the, the reality is for most of you, when you're, if you're going to take an AP course, most of you are going to get mostly A's in most of your AP courses. And that's not, that's, you know, given who you are, given where you started, that's not an unreasonable expectation. But don't feel like you have to be perfect. And at the same time, so challenging yourself is good, but don't challenge yourself so much that you're in over your head. And that's a very that's that's occasionally tricky waters to navigate. Your goal should be your goal should be to get your goal should be to get an A in the AP course. That doesn't mean you've got to always do it. Away oh, in the back, awesome. I'm Lindley. I'm from Texas. Um, if you're looking for a success, both athletically and academically, how do you recommend like splitting your energy time wise? Oh, that's great. Um, and you know, I mean, not surprisingly, we at Duke find a lot of students that that have, are interested in that particular in that particular balance. Um, what you didn't mention was sleep. Uh, <laughs> that sometimes comes into the equation. Healthy living, right? Uh, that's what parents are there for. Um, by the way, by the way, I, as the dean of admissions at Duke University, hereby grant to all parents and guardians the absolute and unfettered authority to take away electronic devices from your children. <laughs> and to plug them in overnight, far away from where your child is sleeping. All right, so that's, that's just the dean of admissions at Duke said so. All right, so. Anyway, sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, so, so here's the thing. Um, you, will find, you will find that if you have good study habits, which most of you probably do, um, although probably some of you don't because you've been able to just sort of go bing, 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 and it's done, right? Yeah, OK, so good luck with that. Um, you may even be able to get away with it at high school. And then after graduating well from high school and going to the sort of college that you really want to go to, um, <laughs> you know, to be ready for the fall. But, but so developing good study habits is good. So um, you will find with good study habits that you have some time. And I think athletics are a really great, healthy, appropriate way to spend the time that you're not spending studying. The main thing is, as long as it doesn't interfere with your schoolwork, as long as you feel like, as long as you feel like I've done well and I've done as re as well as I reasonably can expect to do, um, uh, uh, you know, don't let don't let extracurricular activities interfere with doing as well as you feel like you reasonably should do. Um, but as long as as long as as long as you're doing okay in school, then athletic, I think athletics is is great. And by the way, parents, all right, this is this is one of those things, right? If there's a choice between playing like field hockey, or you know whatever, um, and and the difference between a 99 and a 98 in a grade, you know. If it's a difference between a 90 and an 80, yeah, you know, don't do field hockey. 
But if it's the difference between a 99 and a 98, it's like that, that extra, that, you, at that point, you're beyond the po point of diminishing returns. Let them, let them play. Let them do sports. Let them, let them do the, the fun things that they should do. Hi, I'm uh, Jason from North Carolina. Uh, I know this is kind of a broad topic, but uh, as a homeschool parent, is that something that you guys are seeing more of? And it, it seems like that makes you guys' job harder uh, when you don't have class rank and, and GPA and you can't look at the local high school right. for comparison. How does that, yeah. what do I need to avoid or, or, or to do? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and we are seeing more homeschooling than we used to. And one of the things that's been, you know, I've been in admissions now, I think, 35 years or so, um, and one of the things, one of the really gratifying things that, that I've seen is the change in attitude on, in, on the part of admissions people towards homeschooling. Because, there, because frankly, 35 years ago, there was a stigma attached to it. And because we had doubts, you know, we would have doubts about sort of the social development of students that were, that were homeschooled. And I'm re it's really gratifying to see that's really gone out the window. Um, and homeschool students are really as fairly evaluated as everybody else. Um, so there are a couple of things. One of the things that's really important when a child is being homeschooled is to put them in a situation where they can, where they can get, if you will, a letter of recommendation from someone who's not a parent. Right. Because, I mean, look, all right, so complete honesty here. When I, when I am reading the guidance counselor recommendation of a homeschooled student, and it's from their mother or father, right? And it starts with things like, you know, you know, yes, I'm his parent, but I think I can be unbiased. You, you can't, okay? You just can't. You can't. You can't. Uh, um, so, so the so the important thing is to put them in situations whether it's summer programs, whether it's college classes, whether it's a class at the, you know, whether it's a class or two um, at a local school um, or a community college, um, the, the, it's useful for us to hear about what they're like in a context with other students uh, of roughly the same age or a little older. It's a really unusual, it's really unusual for us. I would say very rare for us to see a student whose entire academic experience has been homeschooled and with nothing and with no other outside academic experience. I will say, to be fair, I will also say, again, to be completely honest, it does put it does force us to put a little more emphasis on standardized test scores. Not just SATs, APs, subject test scores, you know, the, the sort of score, you know, the sort of scores that give us a sense, independent of what the parent is telling us, um, of of how well a child is doing in particular coursework. But but there's no there's no bias. There's no, I mean, you know, every every family is different, every school is different. We try to accept students from where they're coming from. Okay, another one, way in the back. Sure. Um, I'm Angela and I'm from Florida. Um, for the more selective colleges, is it more important to be well-rounded or to focus in like a particular area? That is a great question. That is a great question because um, there's a history of selective college admissions, and and the model used to be, the model used to be that the well-rounded student is what everybody was looking for. You know, they do a little of this and they do a little of that, and they and they spread themselves broadly, and they you know, they've got a wide range of interests and a wide range of skills, and then. I don't know, probably about 25, 25, 30 years ago, the model started to change, and what colleges said they were looking for was the well-rounded class as opposed to the well-rounded students, right? Sort of a well-rounded class full of what were called angular students, you know, so students who really focused on one thing, right? And that kind of freaked people out. And, and, and I'll tell you what, 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 what um, exacerbated that was then, was then people like me, but not me, uh, you started using the word passion, you know, you know, show us what your passion is, right? So everybody's freaking out, it's like, you know, oh my God, you know, I don't have a passion, you know, it's like I like things. Um, it's like, oh, you know, what's my, you know, what's my passion gonna be, you know, and, all right. So, so, um, so here's the thing, interestingly, 
there aren't enough angular students to fill selective colleges. There just aren't. Most students are not angular. Most students are not focused. Some are. Most aren't. Um, my daughter wasn't. You know, she was kind of all over the place. Um, she and and so what we want. So here's. So I don't like this word either, but it's the best word we've got right now, um, which is. And you'll hear this in the next five years. Authenticity, right? Be authentic. You know, whatever that means. Um, but but. So the question is, if you have a narrowly focused set of interests, pursue them. If you have a wide range of interests, pursue them. What we're interested in is getting a sense of who you are and what you're about. We will be interested in, we will be interested in, in angular students. We will be interested in, in uh, well-rounded students. I would say my sense is that for most selective colleges, um, certainly for, for selective universities, um, the overwhelming majority of students are well-rounded. Um, and and we, so we keep an eye out for those angular students because we think they're great. Um, and they're artists or they're musicians or they're, you know, or they're scientists or they're, or they're writers. Um, and they're great. And we love them. And we love them. Um, but, but be who you are uh, and, and, and be, as, be as much who you are as you can be. And, and that's the best way to go. OK, we're going to do one more question. Gary, yep. you have it. And the last question right here. As I said, I'll stick around. For those of you that are anxious, uh, so I'll stick around afterwards. I come from somewhere that can honestly only be described as a small town. OK. Is, could, so there's not as many opportunities. Yeah. Will that ever be just an irreplaceable setback or no? Are you kidding? It's an irreplaceable opportunity. OK. You know, so, uh, you know OK, so I have to tell you something. All right, so. so um, what time is it? How much time do I actually? OK, OK, so I'll keep this short. Um, uh, we are, if you could sit and hear how we talk about students, um, it's always narrative. It's always, we tell stories. Now, sometimes the stories are only a sentence long or three sentences long. And one of the things that we as admissions officers are, are pretty good at is distilling the application essence, which is not the true essence, but the application essence of a student, down to a couple of sentences. Okay. Um, so so we, when you listen, if you, if, you know, somebody who's a good admissions officer tells great stories about their school. Somebody who's, somebody who's a good admissions officer tells the story of the applicant. So it's not, you know, it's not a matrix of qualities. It's a story about someone. Right? So, um, so we'll just start, you know, small town girl is not a bad beginning to a story, right? For that matter, neither is big city girl, right? Um, that's pretty good too. But then it's like, okay. What happens next, right? Like, what's the story? So I understand exactly what you're worried. I, I should say, I believe I understand what you're worried about in terms of there are just fewer opportunities. There are fewer opportunities in some cities, towns, there are counties. There are fewer opportunities in some schools. So, I, and listen, I mean, one of the things, one of the one of the irreducible facts of admissions is that is that families have different resources. Communities have different resources. Schools have different resources, right? So, so the question we ask always is, how have you played the hand you've been dealt? What have you done? Not, not what have you done. That's not what we ask. It's like, it's what have you done given where you started? What have you done, given the circumstances that you were born into, that you don't really have much control over, and you don't have, you know, you don't have control over where you go to school. You don't have control over the town that you're living in. Um, but what you do have control over is what you do with that. Colleges, colleges, selective colleges love people that sort of go, all right, what are the opportunities in front of me? What am I going to do with those opportunities? If I need to, you know, if I need more opportunities. Where do I find those opportunities? You, 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 people from small towns, people from people who don't have as much, 
have an opportunity that uh, it's a weird kind of thing, but they have an opportunity to show what they do when they're faced with limitations. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do everything. You don't, you know, you don't have to, and your parents are not going to let you do Berlin, you know, for a month by yourself, right? That's not going to happen. But, but um, we're really interested in stories and, and uh, that, that, um, that is not a disadvantage at all. I will finish with one final thing, um, and it's a plug, not for Duke, but for me. Um, so about, well, not really, for you. Uh, about three years ago, I was interviewed uh, uh, by a guy who does a video blog for Forbes magazine. Um, and and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a video out there, and you can actually find it uh, on the internet, of a 45-minute interview, one-on-one -on -one interview with me um, about the college admissions process. And I only share that um, because I've actually had people come up to me without my prompting them to say, you know, that was really useful and that was really interesting. So if you Google Forbes and Gutentag, happens to be my last name, if you just Google Forbes and Gutentag, it's like one of the first three results you get. Um, and it's, you know, and it's 42 minutes and, and, and so if, if you want, you know, if you want to hear more about, even more about sort of what I think about college admissions, um, you can, you can go there and you may find it useful. So uh, with that, I think it's a good time for us to stop. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much.